Well, I want to thank all of you for coming, and uh, I'm looking forward to, to what the Lord will do as he, as he witnesses to what's in us. And I really enjoy this ministry because it's not a ministry of creating anything in a person. You know, there's a lot of pressure when you've got to create something in someone. And instead of us creating something in someone, God has put Christ in us. And so it's not a ministry of creating, but it's a ministry of revealing people's hearts. And do you know that that's one of our jobs in the end times, is that we're not out here creating hearts. We're out here in our preaching to reveal hearts. And you reveal what is in someone's heart when you bring Christ before them. And so I don't have a lot of pressure on myself because I'm always witnessing to what's in someone. If it's in them, then you're going to hear in yourself a divine amen as I'm talking. And you know what that amen sounds like. And what an amen is, and the reason an amen comes, is that I'm witnessing to a truth that is already in you. And when that truth that is in you hears a truth coming from outside you and has a witness, there's a divine explosion and a divine amen. Now, as I go along, I'm hoping, and it's my prayer, that he's speaking through me the things that are already in you, and you'll hear an amen, but every once in a while you're going to hear something that goes, what? That can't be right. The guy's crazy. And the reason you're hearing that is that it isn't right, and the guy is crazy. Because God allows every teacher to say things that are nuts. Now, why would he do that? because he never wants you following a teacher. He wants you following him. Now, I get a lot of rebukes in the mail, which is uh, really nice. And uh, since email's kicked up, I can even get more. And I really try to read through those and see to what degree what a person is telling me is true or not. I don't want to have a thick skin, and I want to be teachable, and, and I want to learn. But one of the things I'll always write back to a person when I get a rebuke is, first of all, why are you even thinking about me? Think about Jesus. Get your mind back on him. I don't know how you even had time to write me the rebuke, but you did. But really, I'm not worth focusing on like that. You focus on Christ. The second thing I'll say is, is that when a man is right about everything, he's wrong about everything. And he's not wrong in what he says necessarily, but he's wrong in the attitude. Because it's not what you do, it's why you do it. And I don't need to be right in everything, and I'm not right in everything. And God allows every teacher to say things that are just wrong. So it's up to you in your own discernment and your walk with God to let the peace of God rule in your heart and you judge what's being said. Now as I go along, uh, I realize I don't have everything put together perfectly. I was talking to an old man in England and telling him everything I knew and I talked to him for about three hours because I wanted to impress him. And when I got done, I said, well, what do you think about those topics? And he said, no, brother, no, brother, you keep talking because you're the first person I've ever met that knows everything there is to know about God. Well, that shut me down. And I don't think that I do know everything there is to know about God. But I do know this one thing that I won't budge from, and it's a central theme, and we'll be talking about it for several days now. And it's just this simple truth that I have Christ on this hand and I have problems on this hand. And when Christ is my focus, no matter how good, big my problems are, they don't overwhelm me. But when my problems are my focus, I'm completely undone. And I don't have any hope. If you listen to a man teach and preach long enough, he'll reveal his weakness. And my greatest weakness in life has been the one of focus and the one of abiding and keeping Christ before me and not all of my problems before me. You know, after all, if I thought about you all day, I'd be depressed too, wouldn't I? So if I spend all the time just thinking about me, I'm going to be depressed. And me is so entrenched in me, it's very, very difficult to get Christ here. And he keeps bringing situations into my life that I cannot handle that drive me to making him my focus. So he gives me that perfect peace. I know that that message is truth because truth is not preached. It's demonstrated. And I've had people in my office that have suffered great losses, that they've had a death in the family. Uh, they've had a divorce. They've had a trauma. They found out something about their children. And do you know before I go anywhere with them, I just slowly start talking and moving the whole conversation to Jesus. Well, I want to talk about that later, but right now I want to tell you something I learned about Jesus this week. And as I keep moving toward Jesus and see their focus, all of the sudden they'll be smiling. 
Now, that doesn't mean they still don't have a painful event to deal with. But our emotions run on two tracks. We can have joy on this track and we can have mourning on this track. We can have concern on this track, but we can have the peace of God on this track. And those two things run together. So often we try to put the trains on the same track and it just doesn't work. But I know when he's the focus, everything changes. One fellow and I have had more than one story like this, and any of you that do counseling know what I'm talking about. Uh, some of the beatings that people have gotten as, as a child is horrific. And uh, I was talking to a fellow whose father's choice of a weapon to beat him with was barbed wire. So he had scars up and down his whole body. And uh, his dad had died at age 12. He'd gone into therapy, I think, at age 15, and he's now in his 50s. So we're looking at 40 years of therapy. And the last five years of therapy, the doctors held a mirror up in front of him and one behind him so he could see a scar on his back, just his back. And he'd see the big scar and he'd say, do you remember that scar? And he'd say, yes, I remember that scar. And, and so they'd talk about the scar for about an hour and a half. Then they would visualize the father in the chair and the... Um, uh, he'd talk to the father and he'd forgive him and then he'd come back the next week to look at a new scar. They'd done 60 some scars in five years. I'm listening to this thinking, well, what, Lord, what are you going to give me to say to him? What do you say to someone like that? That is a horrific story. What do you say? And then like that it came to me. And I leaned forward and I pulled my chair toward his. I put my hand on his knees and I said, brother, the Lord just spoke to me. I've got one word that will change your whole life. Just one word. And if you take this word and you let it move from your head into your heart, you'll never be the same man again. You'll be free as a bird. And he looked at me and he said, what's the word? And I leaned forward and I said, boring. He just stared at me. I said, boring. You are the most boring guy that I've ever talked to. I've been in this business for years and I've never been this bored. How long can you talk about a scar? I said, what is there to say about a scar? What is there to say about a beat? You're the most boring man I've ever met. How many times have you told this story? I feel like sharpening my pencil and falling on it right now. I want to end the whole thing. I can't even stand listening anymore. It's boring, brother. It's boring. How can you go on like this? I said, get a life. If I thought about a scar all day long, I'd be a mess too. Why don't you think about Christ? Why don't you get Jesus here? Do you see that if you hadn't have been beat like that, you would have never come to Jesus? Now, I'm not saying that God did it. I'm saying that God permits what He could prevent. He permitted that into your life. And you're so hard-headed that even after 12 years of beating and 50 years of obsessing on it, you still won't put your eyes on Jesus. I'd have beat you again right now. And his wife looks over at him and says, go look in the mirror. And he goes, why? And she said, you're smiling. I've never seen you smile. <laughs> and he felt his face and he goes, I am smiling. He goes, why am I smiling? You're the rudest man I've ever met. <laughs> I said, you're smiling because you have your eyes on Jesus for once. I'm not saying those things are, 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 aren't bad, but where do you put your eyes? And there's nothing that his nearness will not fix. There's nothing that his nearness will not cure in, in our lives. And, we, and it's proven. It's not something that we just preach. It's demonstrated. And we're not here to go through this material then to get an education because how well does an education work? Three years of being educated by Jesus left men denying him and, and behind closed doors. So I don't want an education. In fact, how well does an education work for your own kids? How well does the information work? I sat down to write a letter and I was giving somebody a whole bunch of information and I got to the end. And isn't it nice on computers you have the delete button? Because I thought this information is no good. This person doesn't need information. They need a revelation. You can't approach Christianity like chemistry. It's not chemistry. It's a revelation. We have to see it in our spirit. And in fact, Christianity is the ugliest religion in the world.